Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm going to start off today. Mike will be joining us in a few minutes uh, after I'm done. And uh, welcome. Yes, as Charlotte said, it's a beautiful uh, spring season out here, at least in the Piedmont in the central part of the state. Um, and uh, basically, things are coming alive. Uh, the, uh, things are out and about. And today, I want to start off with this thing, uh, peeking through a hole in a leaf that it made. Um, so, holy roses. Um, these are, uh, today I'm going to talk about things that are creating holes in your roses throughout the season, uh, and really just focusing on uh, some soft flies, actually. So, the roses are leafed out right now, um, and you may notice these little tiny window panes in the leaves and becoming holes. And this is almost certainly due to a few species of sawflies. Uh, and I'm going to go through the different species that are going to be affecting rose throughout the year. Um, these are in the, in the order Hymenoptera. So they are uh, related to bees and wasps and ants. Uh, but they're a more primitive group, the sawflies. Many of you may be familiar with them. Uh, but if you're not, we can at some point talk a little bit more about them uh, in the future uh, in general. Uh, but basically, in North Carolina, they're almost certainly one of three species of Tenthrodinidae, uh, which is the common sawfly family. Most sawflies are actually in that family of, uh, of, of sawflies. And uh, the species vary in damage and life cycles. So first, uh, let's see. There we go. All right, now find the sawfly larva. So as with many pests, oftentimes you want to look on the undersides of the leaves. This is the underside of a rose leaf. And uh, you know, they can be cryptic because they are the color of the leaves often. So if you couldn't find it, here it is, it's down here on this leaf. You can see, you can barely see the body. Now, of course, the camera flash might have been uh, watching that a little bit, but you can see a little tiny bit of the head. Uh, and this is one I found on roses in my yard. And this is uh, one of those three species. Now, all these groups, uh, when they're adults, are going to be a wasp-like insect. Here is this species, but uh, they all look fairly similar, may not have the crazy antennae like this. Um, but this, this is what an adult sawfly looks like. Again, it looks like a little wasp. Uh, they will be flying around the roses uh, right before they're laying eggs. Uh, they'll be mating. And they're called sawflies because females in this group of wasps have this flat uh, saw-like ovipositor, and they use it to insert their eggs into the plant tissue. Um, some will insert it in the edge of the um, of the leaf, some of them in the midrib, uh, depending on the species, and uh, the larvae will hatch, begin to feed, and when feeding is complete, uh, the larvae often move to the ground to pupate in the silken cocoon. Um, I see a question about the larva. I will be showing all the larvae specifically now. Um, so just be patient. Um, okay, so I just wanted to show the adults. They're, they're only around for a small, a short time, period of time. The larvae are around for a little bit longer. Um, and, uh, but this is a basic form of an adult uh, sawfly, of a common tenthrodidin sawfly. So the first one that I showed was the bristly rose slug sawfly. Uh, now many of these are called slugs. They are not true slugs as in gastropod mollusks, uh, which everybody is pretty much familiar with, but many of them, uh, the legs are very obscure and so they look kind of slug-like. But the first species, this is the one that I actually had on my roses. Uh, this is Cladius deformis. You are so distractible. I'm sorry, I just heard something. Um, so uh, this is actually a hairy sawfly, uh, which is actually uncommon. Caterpillars, uh, true caterpillars uh, in the Lepidoptera, the moths and butterflies are very often uh, hairy and they actually have a number of diagnostic CD all over the body. Sawflies typically are not hairy. They may have little uh, spines, like fleshy spines, things like that. This is one of the few that actually is hairy. Uh, so that's one diagnostic feature of this species. 
Now these start in early spring. I actually was looking for them. Uh, I saw no activity and then I went away on a trip and I came back and then there are holes and all these larvae. So I just missed the young ones. Uh, like many of the sawflies, they begin by skeletonizing the undersides of the leaf. And as they get larger, they will chew holes uh, in the leaf. And these are only about five millimeters or so long when they're large. Uh, so you can see on the leaflet here, and uh, if we go back, um, let's see. If we go back, you can see how small they are on a, on a leaflet. Um, now these, this species can have multiple generations per year, especially in warm weather. Um, and actually is known to feed on some cane berries and strawberries in addition to rose. Um, so again, this will start off with the undersides of the leaves, start skeletonizing small windows, you'll get larger windows um, and completely chew through the leaf when they're larger. Okay, the curled rose sawfly, uh, Atlantis cinctus. Um, this is a pale green uh, sawfly larva with these white kind of knobs all over it and an orange head. Uh, and as the name implies, they're often curled on the host. So they'll, they'll sit there like a little snail almost on the underside. Uh, the young will skeletonize the leaves, but in uh, contrast to the other one, the older ones will actually uh, feed from the edge of the leaf to the center. Uh, so they don't make big holes in it. They, they will chew like a, a typical caterpillar, say, uh, where it chews from the outside to the inside. This is an interesting one, and apparently it pupates in the pith of pruned canes. So it can actually, if it bores in, it can actually cause some damage to canes, depending. Um, but uh, I don't know how common this one is in, in our area. Again, I, uh, I'm looking out for all of them. I saw the hairy one first, the bristly, uh, and uh, I'll be looking out for this one later. There are likely two generations in North Carolina, and they apparently start in early summer. Now the last one is gonna be the rose slug, uh, and Endelomaya aethiops. Uh, the larvae don't have ornamentation. They look similar, they don't have the hairs, they're like the bristly one, they don't have the little white dots all over them, and they're much more slug-like, uh, where the, you can't barely see the legs. And you can see why they're called slug, uh, slug sawflies or rose slug. They're gonna have a greenish yellow body with an orange head, and this is an interesting one in that they basically only skeletonize the leaves and typically the upper surface of the leaves, which is kind of strange in my opinion. Oftentimes insects are hanging out on the undersides of leaves. Uh, you may begin to see these around May or June and damage can be severe. You can see this picture down here um, and I'll show you one in a second that is horrifying. Um, and these have one generation per year and they're gonna overwinter as a pupae in cocoons uh, in the ground. So we got a sample in in May of 2013 of this rose bush. Now, there was no direct evidence. We didn't get any photos of any actual larvae, uh, but we, I could see some frass in this photo close up. And I'm not sure if this was the only rose within 100 miles or what, but it got completely decimated by whatever was feeding on it. And when you look up closely on this photo, you can actually see the chew marks up to the midrib. And due to that uh, skeletonizing uh, the upper surface of the leaves, it's m almost certainly the rose slug. Uh, but again, we didn't have direct evidence, but you can see how much damage they can cause. Now, speaking of that, uh, the damage rarely causes death in the, in the, plants, uh, unless it's severe year after year and it, and it begins to uh, be detrimental to the plant, it's really aesthetic damage. Now, if you know what you're looking for, if you know you have infestations, um, basically catching the larvae early, uh, you can actually pick off leaves or pick off the individual larvae off your plants if you only have a few plants, just searching on the undersides of the leaves, searching around, and uh, that should help control them. Um, in large landscapes, uh, you can use chemical control. Of course, I'm not going to specify any particular chemical control uh, because there are different ones available and, uh, and uh, for the homeowner. But 
just note that they will not respond to BT or Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a common control for caterpillars of Lepidoptera, but they are not caterpillars, and so they will not be affected by BT. Uh, and we've actually had some issues with other sawflies where people treated with BT and didn't realize it was a sawfly and it was unable to work uh, against them. Okay, uh, any questions about sawflies, the rose sawflies? Now, I should note that up north, uh, there is another family, the Argidae, uh, that have a species that's known on roses as well. It's much different looking, it's much more colorful, it's a little paler body with black knobs all over it, uh, but otherwise, uh, we really shouldn't get it heat down here. It's more of a, much more of a northern species. Okay, well. Uh, oh, so Matt, I just wanted to, so you said so when you get the skeletization, that yes. is almost always the last one we looked at, the rose slug. But when you're having, do the ones that make little holes, the first two we looked at, can they also skeletonize or is it usually typically little holes like we saw in the first picture? Yeah, so the, uh, the previous two will skeletonize when they're younger and they skeletonize from the underneath and they usually make kind of, uh, we'll go back, and show so you can see on this photo right here this the windows caused by the skeletonizing on the undersides now it's very minor and it's a much more kind of defined in little patches and it's not on the upper surface uh, so again if you're seeing these windows appear just look on the underside you may see these little tiny uh, larvae as in here and um, but when those two other groups get bigger, they basically completely defoliate or start to chew large holes in the leaves. Um, it's only really the rose slug in particular that basically does almost all skeletonizing damage. A good question. Thanks. All right, on to another pest. Uh, Narcissus bulbfly. Now, I did talk about this when I first started, but that was six years ago. So I figure it's time for a refresher, and I've seen a couple of them out when I was outside recently. Uh, this is a hoverfly, uh, Meridon equestris is the name. It's originally from Europe, uh, and as you saw in the previous uh, slides, actually all of those species of sawflies are non-native. They are all actually also from Europe. So when people came over here with all these beautiful flowers and things like that, they probably brought them hundreds of years ago. And so now we have them. Uh, these flies uh, affect uh, basically the bulb monocots. Uh, it's called the Narcissus bulb fly because it affects daffodils, Narcissus, but also um, many, other, many other plants, uh, amaryllis, uh, many of the ir uh, irises, many of the lilies, things like that, anything that's kind of iris-like, daffodil-like. Now, these are very bee-like, and actually I put it in the quiz last time when I was talking about solitary bees, uh, but again, they only have two wings, as all flies do, uh, if they have wings, some flies don't have wings at all. Um, and the wing venation is very characteristic. Apparently, somebody called this a sock, but it's basically got this kind of boot or sock-shaped cell in the front wing. You can see it right here on this photo. And, um, and basically, that's how you identify this fly. So adults emerge in April, May, and mate, and they'll take nectar. You can see these ones are covered in flower pollen here, these mating uh, individuals. Um, the females lay eggs in the bases of the leaves and the stem, and they can produce 40 to 100 per female. And these hatch in about two weeks and begin to feed. And you can see this is a, the maggot in the bulb. Uh, so it's very grub-like, but uh, as with flies, typically in the higher flies, uh, it won't have a head capsule, so it doesn't have a defined head. It'll just kind of have little hooks in the mouth and the fleshy area. And for surfids in particular, they often have these two little breathing tubes that are up on a little telescopic kind of mound. Um, so if you find uh, declining uh, irises, uh, narcissus, anything like that, maybe pull up some some of the plants, check the bulbs, if they've got these little maggots in them, which aren't super small, because uh, this is a fairly uh, large fly. It's about a small bumblebee sized. Um, 
then uh, that may be the issue that's happening. Now what to do? Uh, so one thing you can do is cut the old leaves in late spring and cover bulbs with soil. Uh, this will keep them from finding the host and being able to access the base of the plants. Uh, check and destroy infested bulbs. This can reduce the populations out there. Um, you can capture and kill females patrolling the bulb area. So if you see a lot of these flies, especially if you have a large planting, you see a lot of these bumblebee-like flies uh, flying around. Uh, catching them, you know, with a net or something like that can take them out of the population. Um, and I've heard and I've read that if infested and it's not fully uh, fed on, some bulbs may be submerged in water, uh, kept at about 100 degrees F for 40 minutes to kill the maggots. Now, again, I've only read that. I don't, I've not tried that myself. I actually, irises in my yard seem to be the opposite, doing cra going crazy rather than declining. Um, but um, that may be an option. So again, if you have some prized plants and you really wanna save a variety or something like that that's being attacked, that may be an option. Okay, uh, any questions about the Narcissus bulb fly? Okay. Have you ever seen a report of them on Zephranthes or rain lilies? Ooh, that I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure, but I can certainly uh, search if you want to contact uh, me with that name. Uh, I can uh, I can see if there's any host records of that. Thank you. But I'd be curious. Yeah, apparently, you know, when I saw that host range, it's apparently many of the uh, bulb flowers, the monocots. It doesn't affect uh, other plants types. And I don't, I don't see it as much of as a huge problem, but uh, it's, it's interesting. It's one to note. And like I said, the other day I was outside and saw one just sitting on a, on a hydrangea leaf, just waiting. Um, and uh, so I knew they were out and about right now. So if you notice these flies, again, they're, they're very large, very conspicuous um, flies. Okay. All right, first quiz. All right, let's see. Uh, let's see. All right, which of these is a mosquito? We've got a lot of things coming to light right now, a lot of things swarming around. I know my doorways and everything like that. A lot of people are, are taking photos of things and saying, oh, look at these giant mosquitoes or these little mosquitoes or whatever. Oftentimes they're not. Okay. Okay, we'll give everybody about five more seconds. All right, I'm gonna end it there. Okay, so we have a lot of uh, a lot of B's, the mostly B's, um, some A's, some E's, D, and C. So people know that C is a is a mosquito. Okay, that's good, because uh, I sometimes get that. All right, um, I'm gonna close this out. So a lot of people said B. Well, I tricked you. None of the above. Uh, I put the B B in there on purpose. I actually see them around my door every once in a while. So this is what those are. So um, basically the, uh, uh, the one on the left is a non-typical non-biting midge, a chironomid midge. Uh, oftentimes they have very long front legs that they hold out in front of them, but this is a very common uh, fly that looks like mosquitoes. It's kind of closely related, but they're very common around aquatic situations and basically everywhere very attracted to lights. They swarm around houses sometimes in nuisance numbers, but they don't bite. The crane fly here is an interesting one. Now, most crane flies have short mouth parts, uh, but this is the genus Geranomia, which feeds on nectar and so has these long mouth parts to suck nectar, but not to bite people. Um, the next one is a fungus gnat in the mycetophility. Uh, note that they're kind of hunchbacked and they have these spines all over their legs and especially these large tibial spines or spurs at the end of the tibia. Um, and the last one is actually a phantom midge. 
very closely related to to um, to mosquitoes. Um, probably actually the sister group, which means the most close relatives. Their larvae are predators in water, but um, they they look similar to mosquitoes, almost identical to mosquitoes, except for their mouth parts are very short. And so, what does a real mosquito look like then? So the characteristics of real mosquitoes is that they have this long proboscis, of course, and that's used to pierce skin and suck blood. They oftentimes hold their legs out above them uh, and their hind legs are curved, kind of. Um, they are also covered in scales. So unlike some of the other groups, which kind of are smooth, so this crane fly is fairly smooth and shiny, so it's got a lot of wing veins. Mosquitoes have fewer wing veins and have scales all over the wings. And so if you get one up close, you can see those scales. And actually the body pattern and colors of the scales are very diagnostic for mosquitoes. Okay, so not everything flying around your lights that looks like a mosquito is a mosquito. All right, what the heck is that? So I put this in because I saw one the other day. And if you forced me to pick a favorite insect ever, it would be this. And this is a really interesting insect. Um, I'm not sure if it's necessarily more common right now, but you'll see it throughout the summer. You may see it, you may not see it, um, but they're really interesting. People might see that and, and uh, ooh, somebody sees several of those a year. You are very lucky. Um, so this is a really interesting insect called a phantom crane fly. Now it is not a true crane fly. And in fact, in my studies, I found that it's not related to really any group of flies in particular. It's kind of its own group. Um, and this is our, we do have some non black and white ones in the East, but this one, Batacomorpha clavipes has these inflated legs. And let's see if I can do this, if this will go. Um, so the really cool thing about this, is everybody seeing the screen change? Anybody see that? I'm not seeing it. It just froze when you clicked on the video. Okay, here, let me, um, okay, my, let's see. Let me see something real quick. Let me share this. Okay, can everybody see that now? YouTube? Yes. Great. So when they fly, actually, this is where they get their name Phantom Crane Fly from because they, those inflated legs kind of blow in the breeze and when they're flying, they kind of hold out straight. And so they kind of go in and out of the shadows and they're especially found in kind of low swampy areas. Uh, their larvae actually live in mud and have a rat tail, which they stick out of the mud and breathe. Um, they're not commonly found, but these adults when they're flying around are pretty amazing. Okay, so definitely explore some of those. They're a pretty cool group of uh, insects, completely harmless, uh, but I think really beautiful. Okay, let's see. Let me stop that. Okay, all right, let me go back to sharing. Okay, great. Um, all right, can everybody see, are we back now? Yes, you are. Great, okay. Um, let me get my other things in. All right, all right, so that's phantom crane flies. Um, all right, quick note before I get into some bolo, uh, leaf footed bugs versus wheel bugs. Um, anybody wanna put in the chat what they see, the differences between these two sides? Just just describe what you're seeing uh, in the differences. So that both photos, one is uh, two photos together, one showing eggs and one showing the, the nymphs, and the other shows the eggs with the nymphs. Okay, uh, but what I want you to do is actually describe what the differences are that you see. I want you to make some observations. Okay. Right side has more black. Yeah, body color. Bodies are different. 
Yeah. So I get a lot of questions about which ones assassin bugs, which ones are leaf footed bugs. So as people have pointed out on the right, this is a wheel bug. These are wheel bug nymphs. They have a mostly black body with yellow tips, the antennae also. Uh, and then the leaf footed bugs are mostly red. Another difference that I often see is that the, um, the front legs of wheel bugs are much stronger than the back legs, whereas in leaf-footed bugs, the back legs are much stronger than the front legs, uh, as in their, when they're grown up. And lastly, if they're near their eggs, leaf-footed bug eggs are, are barrel-shaped and laid in a row, whereas uh, assassin bug eggs in general, but wheel bug eggs specifically, are more column-shaped and vase-shaped and in a group, often in a resinous kind of case with caps. So basically those are the differences and just to note what they look like when they're grown up this is the difference. We've got the wheel bug here, adult, it's a predator. Uh, don't handle it because they can bite. Uh, whereas these are harmless uh, plant feeders which can uh, cause some issues on some fruits and things like that. But many are actually host specific to say pines or magnolias and feed on the seeds of those, of those plants. Okay. All right. So now for a few bolos. Um, so I started doing some things and I realized we're going to be doing bolos every month. So it makes things a little bit different. So this is Mayish bolos. Uh, they may be end of you know, the next week or so, and maybe early June. So bagworms hatching. So lots of other caterpillars are out and about, but bagworms, People don't notice them until June, but that's when they've gotten too big to control. So if you have plants that are often attacked by them, go out, beat them onto a sheet, some of the branches, see if you can find these tiny, tiny bagworm babies. Uh, they will have the little bags, but that's going to be the best time to treat. 10 caterpillars. It may be, oh, they may be gone by the middle of May, but right now you may be seeing these, these large hairy caterpillars with this white line down the back. That's an Eastern tent caterpillar. And the adults are these really pretty uh, moths with these, uh, these uh, cross stripes on them. May beetles. So these are a type of scarab. They're gonna be emerging and come into a lot of lights. You may have some that are really hairy. You may have some that are completely smooth. Uh, but they are typically uh, have these uh, long antennae, you know, these, these somewhat long antennae sometimes. Uh, they have claws with little clefts in them. It's hard to see here, but they're little, they look like little forks. Uh, and they're kind of generally nut looking. They kind of are brown, uh, pill shaped, and fairly large, uh, up to over an inch long. Leaf beetles, you might be getting a lot of leaf beetles. Some of the vegetable ones like the striped cucumber beetle, the imported willow leaf beetles may be feeding either as larvae or as adults right now on willows. Um, and this is a larger elm leaf beetle, which may start uh, feeding on elms, especially uh, in groups and skeletonizing the plants. Galls, uh, especially of the aphids and the aphid-like insects. So your witch hazels will be getting these aphid galls on them, cut them open, you'll find a little colony of aphids, really just doing some aesthetic damage to them. And then down here are the phylloxerins, which are typically going to be emerging on the um, hickories. And it may be later May that you'll be starting to see the hickories and pecans get these major leaf galls on them. And of course, biting pests. So ticks and mosquitoes are going to be pretty active uh, very soon, uh, if not already. And uh, so keep safe and, and watch out. And with that, I am done my session. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Thanks a lot, Matt. Uh, I assume Mike is up next, is that right? That is correct, can everyone hear me? Yes, I can. All right, I am then going to share, hopefully this works correctly. I wanna make sure I share the slideshow portion of this. So, 
Can everyone see just the slide that says mystery photo? That is what I see. All right. And let's put up a poll here. Are you launching? So uh, about 10 days ago, I head over some for some frozen yogurt with the family. And in the planting bed in the parking lot, there were these things um, amid the small juniper shoots coming up through the mulch there. So what are these? Are these fungi? Are these some kind of roots associated with the juniper? Are they lizard eggs? Are they old golf balls that have peeled the uh, outer covering? Or is it none of the above? Another, I don't think we even need another 10 seconds here. Pretty much everybody has, has got the correct answer. Yes, these are fungi. These are earth stars. And nice coincidence that uh, yesterday was Earth Day. So I'm sharing, you, sharing with you some earth stars for Earth Day. And today's program, I'm going to be calling the People's Choice Awards because the featured First items will be questions that have come from and for and by either Extension Master Gardener volunteers or an Extension agent. The first one I want to do came from Brunswick County and if the sample information there was as indicated, it must have been from the county office. Can anybody verify that? I don't know if the Brunswick folks are there. They said that they shovel pruned this, but wanted to know what the problem was. So I'm going to ask you that question and we'll go with a yes, no poll here. Put in your votes as to whether you think this is Rose Rosette or not. So no one from Brunswick there to confirm or deny that that came from. Give you another five seconds or so here. Is Steve Anderman still on? Okay. Steve, could you confirm if that came from Brunswick or not? From the county office or not? Yeah, yeah, he doesn't know. Okay. Uh, so I'm still not 100% comfortable with the interface here myself. I hope everyone can see the polling results in which it was a very close race between yes and no here. Could someone who said no and has a microphone or else in the chat box, would you care to say why you thought this is not Rose Rosette? Um, this is Gina. I, to me, it looks like um, there's overall kind of wilting and distortion. There's not as much reddish uh, color in the witch's broom. And I don't see the excessive thorniness. Okay. Anybody else want to say what they think? Well, I happen to agree with the majority in this. I don't think this is Rose Rosette for some of the reasons that Gina mentioned. Uh, most importantly, the well, two most important things for me the lack of that reddish color. Now there is some there, but that juvenile red color tends to be retained when you have rose rosette. But also the broom here, the leaves are not only green, but they're very, very narrow, almost like little strings or threads or ferns. And that is not typical of rose rosette. Even though you do get some leaf narrowing, this is a little bit extreme. 
whether or not it has thorns, that can vary. You don't always get that excessive thorniness with rose rosette disease. I think this though is more likely to be a herbicide exposure that caused this particular damage. I'm waiting still on Joe Neal, who's a herbicide expert to weigh in. The other thing that I have at uh, my disposal, which you do not, is the expert opinion of Matt Bertone, who found none of the microscopic Ariophyid mites that would have transmitted the rose rosette virus. So the conclusion at this point is this is not rose rosette, but it does offer a, an opportunity to talk about what you do look for when diagnosing rose rosette. This is a tremendously bad case on a property just across Hillsborough Street from the university here. If you were at the Extension Master Gardener College a couple of years ago, we actually walked out to this site. I believe those shrubs still are there, but they've been pruned back. So they'll be ready to produce more mites and virus this year. Notice the excessive witch is brooming, some uh, dieback going on there. And another shrub here showing things you look for, the the brooms, the proliferation of shoots, the retention of juvenile foliage, smaller flowers than normal, narrow leaves. There's some yellowing in some of those leaves in the broom on the left. You may or may not see the excessive thorniness. And here's one we don't often talk about. The, uh, is my cursor visible here? Yes. yes. All right. Notice how this side shoot is actually wider than the stem or cane that it came from. That's something else to look for. So this is the parent branch and then the side branch is actually wider than it. And there may be some other things to look for too, like excessive flexibility in the canes, but those are the big things. The retention of juvenile red foliage, the brooms, the reduction in leaf size kind of narrowing. The hyperthorniness, if it's there, is characteristic and you know what you've got. And also look for the, the size of the branches relative to the parent branch. And if you've got Matt on hand, then uh, ask him to look for mites. What if you see something like this? Should you panic? Well, this turns out not to be rose rosette at all. This is rose mosaic. It's an oak leaf type pattern. Sometimes it's more of just a, a yellow mosaic. This is from the halcyon days when the only viruses that we had to worry about were rose, with roses were those that were from propagation that couldn't be spread in the environment and that didn't really do any major damage. So this again is not rose rosette, this is rose mosaic, which is caused by one or, or a number of, there are actually three different viruses that could contribute to these symptoms. Oh, and again, before we, uh, before we leave the the uh, rose rosette, there is no cure and the recommendation is still to remove the shrub. This question came through um, something called Facebook, which I don't personally do, but Matt does and he helped me get the pictures in the description so that I could present it here. Uh, Nancy, are you on the program? Let's see if I can. Yes, I think Nancy is. I see her in the um, chat box. Okay, she said she might be. So this is for you. And uh, the pictures that she shared were of a dogwood, Cornus Florida cultivar Appalachian Spring. And she had uh, been originally concerned that she might have dogwood anthracnose on this particular tree. So let's go ahead and relaunch this poll. Are we looking at dogwood anthracnose here? Uh, Mike and Nancy clarified that the left is a native and the right is Appalachian Spring. Oh, okay, thank you. All right, a few more seconds. Let's 
So as you can see, we have a, a split again, but a little bit more lopsided toward the nose. And in fact, the nose are correct. This is not dogwood anthracnose, which has a name, unfortunately, very similar to the name of what this is, which is spot anthracnose of dogwood. And it's caused by the fungus Elsinoe corni. Typically forms small red spots on the bracts. They can be very numerous and coalesce together, giving an almost burnt or frosted appearance to the blossoms. It'll vary a great deal from one year to the next, depending on the weather conditions in the spring. It's, it's important to, to distinguish this from dogwood anthracnose, but one of the clues is that the spots, although they may be numerous and coalesce together, but individual spots are gonna remain very small. They're not gonna expand. And we'll see another clue that we have for telling the difference in just a moment. But we should mention that it does get on leaves of dogwood as well, causing these, again, small leaf spots, as does the fungus septoria, which gets on dogwood. Um, but one of the big things to remember, oh, excuse me, let me, uh, before we get to that, spot anthracnose resistance. So the question is, what should you do about it? Once you see the damage, it's too late to do anything for this year, and fungicides are really impractical unless you've got a real specimen tree in a particularly important location, especially knowing that the disease pressure may vary so much from one year to the next so that it may or may not be uh, necessary, and you have to have several applications starting with bud break and then going into the summer so that you're ready for next year. So the better recommendation is to look for something with resistance. And it turns out that there are some resistant cultivars, including Cherokee Sunset, Cherokee Chief, Weaver's White, Welch's Bay Beauty, and some that are moderately resistant, Cherokee Brave, Double White, Fragrant Cloud, Junior Mist, Red Beauty, Ruber Pink, and uh, there may be some other more recent ones as well. The thing to keep in mind though is, well, two things. One is you'll notice that Cherokee Princess is not on this list. That is actually highly susceptible according to Jones and Benson's book, although it is out there on at least one list on the internet as being resistant. The asterisks here though are to remind us all that you can't just consider one disease when you're picking your resistance. So those with an asterisk are resistant or moderate resistant and with two resistant to powdery mildew, which is equally as big a boogeyman for our flowering dogwood as the spot anthracnose is. Notice that Cherokee Sunset is susceptible to powdery mildew, even though it is resistant to spot anthracnose. And again, Cherokee Daybreak and Cherokee Princess are highly susceptible to spot anthracnose. Now let's compare this to dogwood anthracnose which is also caused by a fungus, but called Discula destructiva, so a different critter. It begins as a leaf spot or blotch, but those will have the capability of expanding. So they can get larger, it can move down into the, into the twigs and even to the trunk where it can cause a canker. And the tree will often produce a lot of epicormic shoots, another symptom that you can look for. This disease is quite serious. It can actually kill the tree. It's not just cosmetic like the dog, or excuse me, the spot anthracnose. And it's worse in forest situations. Also within the state of North Carolina, if you are in these counties shaded in the Western and in the Northern tier, Northwestern tier, those are places where historically dog anthracnose has been found. There was also a find actually in, I believe Dare County, but that would have been from a tree that was brought in from somewhere else. This disease will not occur naturally in the warmer parts of the state. As you go farther north in the country, you don't have to have as high an elevation. So particularly if you are above 1800 feet in elevation, if you are in these counties here, these are places to be aware of and looking for dogwood anthracnose. That said, we have had very few samples. Within the last 10 years, we only had one suspected case of dogwood anthracnose come into the clinic. So it, it is not 
uh, all that common. And again, unfortunately has a name that's very similar to a name, the name of a very common but cosmetic disease. I wanted to mention these resources here. They are for nurseries, so not all the recommendations, particularly the chemical recommendations, will be useful for homeowners that you're dealing with. But they do have a lot of good information about different diseases and pests, including tables. Didn't have for dogwood, but for example, for rose, I'll show you in a moment, tables of cultivars that are resistant to certain diseases. There are three of them, all available on the internet, all free. They're also available as iBooks. One is IPM for deciduous trees, and then there are two volumes for shrubs, each containing several different genera of ornamental shrubs for the Southeast. So if you have a second, jot those down. They all start with wiki.bugwood.org, and then it's either IPM underscore book, lowercase b, or IPM underscore shrub underscore book, or append the Roman numeral two to the end of that. And it'll take you to the table of contents for each of these volumes. So as an example for the rose chapter, here is part of the table listing the different resistances to black spots or cosper leaf spot and powdery mildew among some of the uh, rose varieties or cultivars. Notice that not everything, for example, that has the word knockout in it is gonna be resistant to black spots. So this is a really useful tool. Our final people's choice winner is from Cabarrus County. Doreen Browning sent in a call first and uploaded some pictures and then sent the physical sample of this black cherry tree that went down not in our storms this past Friday, but in an earlier storm. The roots came up out of the soil like this. And when the physical sample arrived, it looked like this. So does anybody know what this is? Let's see here. Okay. Yes, Gina. Yes, Julie. In fact, this is our malaria. And how did you recognize that? Julie, do you have a, a microphone? Maybe you want to say how you got that diagnosis? Uh, yes, from the white um, look up above where the bark is stripped off, you can see, the, see it starting to develop there, that whitish look. All right, very good. That is exactly what we look for. You need a root that's pretty thick. This is, uh, is quite a large one, but I would say thumb size or larger, or else you need the base of the main stem. So we don't really recommend that people take this as an initial sample since it's pretty destructive, but you have to peel off the bark and look there at the interface between the bark and the wood, and you will see that mycelial mat. Now, if we look closely though, That's not the only thing here. And a clue from the common names of the disease, armillaria root rot, it's also called mushroom root rot because it, fungus can produce mushrooms in the fall. But it's also called shoestring root rot. And that's because of the presence of not only the mycelial fan, the, the very fine fungal threads there matted together underneath the bark, but also these root-like structures called rhizomorphs. When they're fresh, they're pretty tough Hard to, hard to break and you look at them under the microscope and you can tell the difference between these and roots, but it's actually a fungal structure that is not always present, but in advanced stages you may see it or you may see it just loose in the soil. I one time had a person submit the uh, rhizomorphs from a landscape bed thinking that they were roots of, of a plant that they were interested in. For Control of this, well, one other thing first is Chuck Hodges pointed out, <clears throat> there are nearby trees in this landscape that could be at risk. So you've got the fungus living in the large dead roots and very easily could have now spread to the roots of some of these other trees here. It has a very wide host range. So pretty much any woody plant is susceptible you wouldn't want to put another tree or shrub in this spot for a couple of years until 
all that material has had a chance to break down completely. But by then you may have some of these trees on the perimeter already infected and then starting to go down themselves. So this is a difficult situation to deal with because you can't eradicate it from the soil and it has such a white host range. Now this one did not come from the People's Choice section of this month, but I wanted to bring it up. It's a disease we need to be on the lookout for in the next month. And it's probably number two on the list of pathogens that's most often falsely accused of causing damage. It certainly does cause a lot, but people are very aware of it. And I think tend to blame it a little bit too often. In this case, this is, yes, Christine, this is fire blight. So we'll notice we have some ornamental pair, the two frames on the left, close up and a, and a farther shot are of ornamental pair. That lower left picture is actually interesting. That tree is long gone, those greenhouses are long gone, but that was here on campus. And um, the rumor is that someone went and actually intentionally inoculated it because it was supposed to be a cultivar that was resistant to fire blight. Also, there was a little bit of an office poll that went on for years uh, based on the date of flowering of that tree. The upper right hand corner, that's a, an edible pear. You can see the large fruit there and you can see some of the flagging branches in the upper right. And then that's his apple with some spur blight there from the, from the fire blight. How this happens is there's a bacterium, it's called Erwinia malavara. It overwinters in cankers and buds and twigs of the apple and pear trees. And then as springtime arrives, bacteria ooze out of those cankers and are splashed or accidentally carried, for example, by flies to blossoms where they infect. And then from there, pollinators move them from blossom to blossom, causing a blossom blight phase. From the blossom under wet weather, it can get in through the neck trees and move down into the twigs and you get the, the twig blight phase over again. So it has kind of an interesting epidemiology of how it, how it spreads. I'm gonna leave the question of management to your further reading here. This is actually geared toward the, um, the apple producers, but there's a, a fire blight information note that Sarah Villani has put out. I want to make uh, a couple comments though about it. And as she says there, really the only thing for cop, as far as uh, homeowners that would be available as chemical control would be the copper products, but you've got to be real careful with those because you can get damage to both the developing fruits and the, and the leaves. So what should have been done if you're having fire blight is to have pruned out those cankers and infected twigs back on a dry day during the winter when you're not going to accidentally spread it around and when the bacteria are inactive. And you're going to want to go several inches, even a foot down into the, the clean wood to make sure that you're ahead of that bacterium. And again, this is a disease of apple, of pear, both ornamental and edible pear. It's even more susceptible than apple. Uh, can even get on cotoneaster, but it does not get on stone fruits. So if you have someone with a pear tree that has a dieback symptom, it is not going to be fire blight. There are some other bacterial diseases, pseudomonas, anthemonas that get on peach. So yes, peach is what I was talking about, but peach will not be susceptible to fire blight. Moving then into our be on the lookouts for May. I was surprised actually a couple of weeks ago now already, I saw my first Fuligo septica fruiting body in a landscape bed at church. And I thought, well, it's kind of early cool weather yet, but there it was, at least it looked like it. So here's a picture from earlier here on, on campus of an early stage of the development in the upper right. Um, this time of year, human error is gonna be probably the most common thing that you'll find either over or under fertilization in the garden or herbicide injury. And notice the picture that we used last year of tomato on the, in the bottom right there. Very typical glyphosate injury on tomato, which is very sensitive. The bright yellow discoloration at the base of, excuse me, 
at the base of multiple leaflets on the leaf here. Other kinds of herbicides cause uh, different injury, distortions, for example, from the 2,4-D. Some people can herbicide injury, herbicides that came in through the roots. In the vegetable garden, this is the happy time really when there's not too many diseases yet, but be aware of the possibility of pythium root rot and damping off, the damping off diseases. Also bacterial leaf spot on pepper and tomato, be very careful with your transplant purchases that those are healthy before they go into the garden. And we can even start seeing tomato spotted wilt virus on tomato. You notice in the photograph some of the typical dark necrotic spots, even on the very young foliage. And this is a virus that's brought in from the weeds where the virus overwintered and brought into the garden by thrips. Flowers, of course, it's the perennials really that are the uh, most prevalent at the moment. Annuals, summer annuals are maybe just getting started or not quite yet, but in some of these perennials, we can get the peony ring spot caused by tobacco rattle virus, either rings or oak leaf patterns, as you can see here on the picture on the right. Daylily leaf streak coming down from the tip and moving down the center of the leaf. Powdery mildew on Coreopsis, lower right picture. Volutella blade on Pachysandra, and Heterosporium leaf spot on Iris. These are all things that you may be seeing in the coming month or so. In turf grasses, once we get warm enough to start stressing the cool season grasses, such as fescue, we could see brown patch. Fairy ring is possible at any time of year on any turf grass. Large patch, which like brown patch is caused by uh, fungus in the genus Rhizoctonia, but in that case, it's one that gets on the warm season grasses during cool weather. And then again, spring dead spot, which I mentioned last time with the greening up of some of our Bermuda grass and zoysia grass areas that were infected by the fungus and died from cold injury over the winter. Finally, in the woody plant area in our fruit trees and shrubs, Watch for cane blight and rust diseases on blackberry. That's a picture that Craig sent there. Indicates there's a uh, probably cane and leaf rust on blackberry. We've seen some uh, leaf infections, probably that same rust as well. Haven't seen orange rust yet this year in the clinic, but that's something else to be aware of on blackberry. And of course, cane blight as well. On apples, our cedar apple rust, which would have been from the junipers, those spores blew over to the apples and caused infections that we'll start, be starting to see, as well as be on the lookout for black rot and fire blight. On bunch grapes, downy mildew and anthracnose would be two diseases to be on the lookout for. And of course, there are many more that we could list, but for the sake of time and space, uh, just move to a few that are on shrubs and trees, or sh shade trees, excuse me, and shrubs, powdery mildew, on dogwoods, as you can see here, it's not always, that's kind of a midsummer picture there. It's not always that thick and easy to see as it is on Euonymus. I've already seen it heavy on Euonymus this year. Watch for it on Spirea, watch for it on Rose. Exobacidium leaf gall, both on Camellias and Azaleas. Phytophthora and Armillaria root rots. Ceridium canker or Cypress canker on Leyland Cypress. And on Maple, Anthracnose and Philistica leaf spot. And Matt, with the, uh, would the eye spot gall on maple be showing up yet? Um, all right, can you hear me? Uh, it will start showing up soon. Um, I think. Let me check. But basically, uh, I don't. I don't notice it until yeah, about May or June. I think that's when you notice it again. That's when the uh, the maggots are gone already. They've dropped to the ground at that point. Uh, but yeah, yeah, within the next month or so, you should start seeing them. So if that's a really distinctive bullseye type spot on the maple leaf, it's actually a gall. Um, in addition to what you need to be looking out for in terms of fungi, the, the anthracnose and the philistic the leaf spots. With that, I'll take any questions. Uh, 
Okay, can I make my slides full screen? I did not know. That was me, Mike. Uh, there was a point where um, they were a little smaller and a little pixelated, but uh, you, it went back to normal after. I'm not oh, sure okay. if you did it on purpose or not, but I thought you had answered it. Oh, all right. We have any questions for Matt or Mike? You can unmute your mic or just pop them in the chat. I'll Thanks, say, Janine. I, I added the links to um, the IPM books that uh, Mike mentioned into the chat list too. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte. I would and really encourage everyone to browse those when you have a chance. Yeah, I'll send them out as well in a follow-up email so you can bookmark them on your computers. There was a question about um, recommendations for powder and mildew. Powdery mildew is is one of those. It, it's um, it all depends on the host. There are some cases where it's going to be so damaging every year that it's not worth doing anything. So that would be, for example, in the case of euonymus, where I would just give up if you've got powdery mildew problems and you're you want to do something about it. I would just change the shrub from euonymus to something else. There are others where, and this would be most cases, where the damage is so light that you don't really need to do anything. And then there's that sort of middle ground where it does enough damage to warrant some kind of, uh, in this case, chemical spray. So then, and it has the hope of doing some good. So for example, on a squash, let's say, in the vegetable garden, maybe on rose, uh, if you've got a susceptible cultivar, there there are a few there where depending on the disease pressure, you may want to do something. The what we call DMI fungicides are usually good for this. A lot of the over-the-counter products, the the multi-disease control products, you can get at the big box stores. Will have one of those, and those are quite good. The um, I don't know if any of the strobilurins are registered yet for homeowner ornamental use. I know they are for turf, but those would also be good. And even things like neem, neem oil or the potassium bicarbonate should have some effectiveness in those cases. There was a follow-up question that says, um, are you saying to remove the bush if it has a lot of powdery mildew? In the case of euonymus, if, if you don't like the aesthetics of it, you're not really going to be able to do much about it. So, yes, that was what I what I would do in the case of a of a euonymus. Yeah, where you know it's going to be a problem every year, year after year, and it's and going to be heavy every year. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Find a better plant. All right. Well. Um, are you guys going to hang around? I've got a few announcements to share. So if we get any more questions coming in just in the next few minutes. Um, in fact, we just had one pop in about root knot nematodes. If you have root knot nematodes in your vegetable plot and want to lay it fallow, should you plant a cover crop? I would say for the sake of the soil, you do want to do that. Uh, our summer thunderstorms always worry about erosion washing away our topsoil. Now, obviously the first thing that comes to mind in that case is marigolds because there are, except for the northern root knot nematode can get on at least some marigold varieties, but in most cases marigold is going to be a good choice if you do a real thick planting of it and then incorporate that um, although, help me out, Charlotte, have, have you seen any problems with crops following marigold that's been incorporated? Seems to me I had heard something about that. Um, I have not. 
I have not heard anything about it. Yeah, don't take my word for that. I'd have to check on it. But a typical recommendation would be a very solid planting of marigolds to reduce your problems with, with root knot. But you definitely don't want to leave that soil bare because, first of all, nature abhors a vacuum and weeds will grow up. And uh, we don't know if those weeds could also be hosts of the, of the nematodes. But as far as some of the typical cover crops in the summertime, let's say a, a buckwheat or something, I don't know if those would be susceptible to root knot or not. I'd have to check. And I have seen um, there are some strains of mustard, some mustard relatives that have shown some effectiveness, um, but it's real specific. So you'd, you'd want to make sure you got the right varieties. Um, especially in, well, we're probably a little at the end of the planting season for things like that, but uh, in the fall or early spring, in addition to, you could do marigolds in the summer and then look and see what else is available out there for the cool season. Yes, I, I'd heard that as well. Didn't mention it because of the, um, because of the season. Mm -hmm. but yeah, brassica is another recommendation, although I hadn't heard the specific detail about certain varieties of mustard being the ones that you wanted to look for. I'll let uh, Charlotte, I'll let you answer Kathy's question. Um, is there a way to revisit the slideshow from our computer? Well, we do have the recordings. We do record these and post them to YouTube. So um, you can visit the, um, in fact, I've got a link here. I'll show you in just a minute the Plants, Pests, and Pathogens webpage and find the link to the site. Um, but let me go ahead and I'll, I'll share these last few announcements and then we'll have time for more questions. Um, just want to say, as always, a huge thanks to Matt and Mike for all the, their expertise that they bring and they share uh, so generously. It's, we're really lucky um, that you're willing to, to share everything you know and see with us um, every month. So thank you. Well, um, we're lucky to have such a great audience and people to help too. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, I just, just want to let you know that there was a um, question from Cheryl about rose mosaic. So I don't know if we want to answer that after your announcements, but, uh, but just to make sure we don't forget. Okay, let's we'll come back to that in just a minute. I did want to mention, um, I had some pictures on our opening slide of uh, coral honeysuckle. So this will be our feature plant for the month. It is a native woody vine that's blooming right now. And you, um, it, it blooms when the hummingbirds start coming back. So it's usually one of the first plants you see hummingbirds visiting. It's a great vine because it's tough and vigorous, but it's not as vigorous as say something like wisteria. Um, it will climb to 15 feet or more. So it needs a good size structure, more than a mailbox. Um, but it will reward you with just tons of blossoms in the spring and will throw out some intermittent flowers over the summer. It's happiest in sun, but it'll take part shade. The more shade it's in, the more it tries to grow to the sun. And um, there's lots more information about it on the plants database. If you go and uh, plants.ces.ncsu.edu and uh, search for Linusra, you'll find it and many other wonderful plants. So just a few announcements. We are still taking applications for Search for Excellence. So we want to hear about the wonderful projects you have going on across the state, what you're doing in the counties, um, how you're sharing education, either with your fellow master gardeners or with the public. And there are awards associated with this. So $200 award for each winner in um, the seven categories. Uh, more information is posted on NCSU Garden and I will send out a, a follow-up email to that um, gives everybody everything they need to know if you want to put in an application. You still have time, but we do need it by um, next week. And those awards are funded by our Extension Master Gardener Endowment. And a great way you can help support the endowment is to purchase a Master Gardener license plate. So you get to show your pride of being a Master Gardener. And then the original purchase price is $20, but half of that, so $10 goes automatically to the endowment when you purchase the special license plate. And um, every year when you renew it, it's $20 and $10 goes back to the endowment. So a great way to um, support the endowment and um, that helps to support the program all across the state. And right now we still have in stock the um, license plates with our watering can logo, which is the older version. When these run out probably later this year, they'll be updated with the new logo, the NC State Brick. So if you really want that watering can, um, I'd recommend going online today to um, 
DMV, you go into North Carolina DMV website and order that um, license plate. Our registration has closed for Master Gardener College, but we have 170 people, volunteers and agents signed up to attend. I just want to say thank you to everybody who helped promote it and spread the word. And really looking forward to seeing everybody there uh, in about a little bit over a month. If you're looking for a conference to attend, there is still the International Master Gardener Conference that has registration open. They have gone up to their late registration fee, which is $390, um, but you can still sign up and um, they have just lots of great things going on. That'll be up in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. And then there are some pretty amazing travel opportunities um, open right now through the NC State Extension Gardener Travel Study Adventures. Um, both Tuscany, Italy and Hawaii, um, with focus on the Big Island will be this fall. And both of those, if you sign up by later this month, end of April, early May, um, that's when the registration is still focused on North Carolina Master Gardeners. And then there will be a trip next spring to Catalonia, Spain. So if you visit um, the web address, and I'll send this as a follow-up, you can read and learn lots more about those opportunities. If you, um, <clears throat> excuse me, don't yet have a hard copy of the Extension Gardener Handbook or want a second one, everybody needs one to stay out in the shed and one to stay in the house, one to stay in your car, um, they are on sale right now. Or if you're looking for a great Mother's Day gift for someone, 40% um, off. So that's more than the 30% off full-time um, discount that Extension Agents and Master Gardeners get. Um, you can't combine them, but you do get 40% off the purchase price, so that makes it $36. And if you order two copies or order other books, so your order is over 75, you get free shipping. And that's direct from UNC Press. You can um, purchase more items with Master Gardener logo through our logo wear store. Um, there's some great new stuff up there, including a, a wide variety of hats, perfect for summer. Um, t-shirts, a, a lot more colors and styles available for t-shirts, 100% cotton as well as um, cotton polyester blends. One thing that we're really excited about is the table runner. Um, so you don't have to buy the full table cover. You can buy the table runner and just lay it over top of any tablecloth you have. Um, so, you know, if you want to use something that's a little more colorful or has flowers on it, that can be your tablecloth underneath and put the table runner on top and it's about half the price of the full size table cover. If you have anything you want to order that's not on the website, just contact the Robert groups directly, particularly um, Cody Williams with Robert's group, and they can pretty much source anything you want um, with the Master Parker logo on it. If you want to stay in touch with upcoming opportunities such as plants, pests, and pathogens, um, register for or sign up for our Extension Master Gardener email list. And then many of you um, are signed up and just want to close with a really big thank you um, to all of our volunteers across the state for all you do. Um, these are just some of the, the numbers from our 2018 annual report. These come through in CSU Garden, what you put in the system. And um, it, it truly is amazing, you know, over 3,000 volunteers, over 200,000 hours, which is more than 100 full-time positions or equal to um, reaching, you know, around 500,000 people. And when we look at the total value of the volunteer time and everything you bring to the program, um, you know, across the state, 7.7 .7 million. So it's pretty amazing. Thank you all. And we will be here again next month, May 28th. We'll have a guest speaker, Mark Hoffman, who will be talking about grapes for North Carolina Gardens. Um, he is our extension specialist for grapes and strawberries. So we really hope to see you again. And here is the link uh, on the bottom here that um, you can go and find the recordings posted. We are converting all the recordings from 2014 to the present to YouTube, which will make them easier to watch. Um, some of the older ones right now, you still have to go through Blackboard Collaborate. Um, but within the next month, they'll all be shifted over to YouTube. All right, so that is my wrap up. So we'll get back to that question. Um, all right. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, actually, I want to finish. I've, I found something that will be helpful to the Pitt County folks who asked the question about nematodes. Here's a link to a note in your chat box. I put a link to a note that's on the nematode assay 
lab at the uh, NCDA, they've got a sp note specifically directed to the use of marigold plantings for reducing nematode. Uh, it's called root knot nematodes biocontrol with marigolds. So that may be helpful for that as well as here's their general information page. Let's see if I can put this in here as well. Come on. So there's some other links there to a number of publications having to do with, with nematode management. Now going back to the question, yes, from Cheryl about rose mosaic. Can you talk more about rose mosaic? I think I may have it on my rose garden. I don't know. Because I don't like the yellow leaves. I just removed those leaves. It's hard to say without seeing at least a photograph, Cheryl, if that's what you've got. But you're welcome to upload. We don't charge anything to diagnose photographs. So if you want to upload that to our database and we'll take a look. Um, yeah, there really is nothing you can do. It's something that would have been, if that is rose mosaic, there are, like I say, a couple, three viruses that, that can cause those symptoms and it would have been there since it was propagated and you're not going to be able to get rid of it. But again, it's more of a cosmetic issue and won't affect, um, it won't kill the, tr kill the shrub put it that way, the way rose, rosette can and, and it's not as um, aesthetically damaging. But if you don't like the yellow leaves and you remove them and that's working for you, that's great. But do send a picture and then we'll see if, if that's what it looks like and that you don't have some other issue going on. All right, my two inch diameter dogwood has the bark missing as though there was a mower injury, even though it's not suggestion, will it die? Um, Matt, you had a, a pine query uh, with some missing bark on something about that diameter, didn't you? A little too small to be a deer rub, but uh, do you want to take this one? Um, yes, yeah, so they were, they were smaller than that. I think there was a half inch to three quarter inch. So two inch, hmm, I, you know, with that, I'd, I'd be curious to see what the rest of the tree looks like, whether it's leafing out all right, anything like that. I mean, I'm wondering if it could be cold injury or something like that, where the, the, the bark is now sloughed off. I don't know of any vertebrates or large animals that would feed on the bark of um, dogwood particularly. Um, so I'd be curious to see what the rest of the plant looks like. Oh, huh. the, de so the de oh, wait, two inch diameter. Oh, two inches above the ground, uh, and it's a two inch diameter dogwood. Um, it now is it all the way around the trunk, or just a patch of it? All right, what I would do is look for uh, whether it seems to be broken off, or whether it's frayed. Uh, you know, some different types of evidence to see whether it's a physical injury, or if it's just weathering away because of some other issue. Uh, those are kind of, and again, um, taking some photos of the whole plant and then uh, close-ups or, you know, within reason close-up of the, the injuries, noting anywhere where it still is on and where it's off uh, and sending those into the clinic might be a good idea just so we can see uh, what, what you're describing. Great. Great. We'll, I, we'll I just put in the uh, the link to our databases where you can, if you haven't set yourself up in our address book, you do that first and then you create a new sample and upload your pictures as well as the description. So yeah, also indicate how long it's been there, if it could have some damage maybe from when it was planted or before it was planted. Um, we can see if it was maybe planted too deeply, other things that might be stressing it. It's, it's hard to say. Not that that would cause directly the, the bark to fall off, but All right, well, yeah, if, if you have a chance, uh, get us some photos and, and we'll take a look. I'll add that uh, link to the chat box. So to submit photos to PDIC, that look like the right place for folks to go. Uh-huh. I don't know what the slash sharp sign is, but. 
Yeah, that's, that's when it. I clicked on uh, all other users log in here. And that's what opens up the place where you can huh. create a, a new account. Yeah, I just clicked on that, that link and it works as well. It does work good, good. All right. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a great, uh, a great service to be able to submit the images, at no charge. All right. Well, we have hit 1130. Um, thanks again to everyone. Special thanks to Janine for her support. And um, I'm going to play our music to close us out. And if you are subscribed to the Extension Master Gardener email list, you'll get a follow-up email with links to some of the resources that were discussed and where you can learn about uh, the announcements we talked about. So until next month, happy gardening.